Rocket Lab's mission statement is, we open access to space to improve life on Earth. Quite an eloquent way to describe the business of launching stuff into space and refining the technology needed to do so. Probing into the workings of this company will clarify the role of commercialization in the burgeoning space economy and reveal insights into the trajectory of space infrastructure and exploration further into the 21st century, mainly in terms of efficient and more affordable access to space, specifically outlining Rocket Lab's business and the underlying technology powering it, can serve as a launch pad towards topics relating to the relationship between privatization and government cooperation, while at the same time, help illustrate the constraints of such partnerships. Delving into these subjects requires us to remember the normalization of companies providing launch services came about due to them building reputations of reliability and cost effectiveness relatively quickly, due in large part to advances in technologies, materials, and components that have allowed for the miniaturization of spacecraft and a significant reduction in cost and time to market all of which took place at a time when demand increased for space applications, such as communications, remote sensing, earth observation, meteorology, and navigation, that then drives the need for regular access to orbit. At the heart of these cosmic shifts are the new generation of launch vehicles. Electron is the name of the one that was instrumental in getting Rocket Lab off the ground from 2017 onwards and helps the company's notoriety. Electron is for putting small spacecraft up to 300 kilograms into low Earth orbit on a frequent basis, which is achieved with two primary stages, followed by a third kick stage that enables spacecraft to be placed in circular orbits, a necessity for a spacecraft to maintain consistent altitude. When combined with the company's photon spacecraft, Individual spacecraft can be deployed in different orbital locations and complete constellations in a single mission. Engine restarts are also possible to deliver multiple payloads to a range of orbits, meeting precise orbit insertion requirements, and deorbiting to avoid contributing to orbital debris, also known as space junk. Reducing space junk is a whole other topic, but whenever it can be reduced, it is a win for humanity's journey to the stars with less debris in the way. Other innovations related to electron revolve around reusability. Electron's dimensions measure 18 meters tall, with a 1.2 meter diameter, and a liftoff mass of approximately 14,000 kilograms. It is also capable of delivering spacecraft such as its own photon spacecraft to deep space and interplanetary destinations, as demonstrated in March 2021 with the launch to the moon as part of the capstone mission, a pathfinder for the Lunar Gateway Initiative of NASA's Artemis program that involves a mini space station NASA intends to use as a staging point for crewed lunar landings. In terms of construction, Electron is a fully carbon composite launch vehicle. Designers note, carbon composite construction decreases mass by as much as 40% relative to other materials, contributing to Electron's mass-to-orbit performance. Power comes from 10 Rutherford electric turbopump engines fueled by liquid oxygen and kerosene fed by electric turbopumps. Rutherford is based on a propulsion cycle that makes use of electric motors and high-performance lithium polymer batteries to drive liquid oxygen and kerosene fuel pumps. The advantage of electric turbopumps is lower complexity than the turbo machinery typically required for gas generator cycles. Rutherford engines are manufactured at headquarters in Long Beach, California with the incorporation of 3D printing and automation. 3D printing also extends to the design and testing of new flight hardware for extra savings in terms of money and time to market. To expand their capabilities, development is underway on a new launch vehicle called Neutron to take on missions beyond the scope of Electron. It is classified as a two-stage medium lift launch vehicle with the first stage designed to be reusable for return to launch site as well as land on an ocean platform. The plan is for neutron launches to take place from Virginia's Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, located at the NASA Wallops Flight Facility, which in the words of Rocket Lab will leverage existing infrastructure at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, with the goal of lessening the incremental investments and accelerating the timeline to first launch, no earlier than the end of 2024. The expected payload capacity is approximately 15,000 kilograms for expendable launches to low Earth orbit whereas lighter payloads can be launched in reusable configurations and into higher orbits and is tailored for large constellation deployments, interplanetary missions, and potentially for human spaceflight. Its dimensions are stated to be 40 meters tall and 5 meters in diameter, 
Some specific applications for Neutron are crew and cargo resupply to the International Space Station, and dedicated service to orbit for larger civil defense and commercial payloads that need a high level of schedule control and high flight cadence. Neutron is expected to benefit from some vehicle subsystems designs, launch complexes, and ground station infrastructure that are already in place for Electron. With their two launch vehicles, Rocket Lab expects to have the capability of launching nearly all of the spacecraft that they expect to launch through 2029. But that's not all, because launch infrastructure is also required to achieve frequent and reliable launches. Rocket Lab operates a private launch complex located in Mahia, New Zealand, that they call Launch Complex 1 LC1. That's their high volume launch complex with two operational launch pads capable of supporting up to 120 missions every year, which is said to be more than the current annual total number of launches from all US spaceports combined. The company explains that operating their own private launch complex eliminated the availability issues commonly faced by other launch providers competing for a limited number of slots on shared launch complexes that they do not control. The other main benefit is being located in New Zealand because of its isolated location that has minimal impact with airspace closures during launches. They also operate Launch Complex 2, LC2, a dedicated launch pad at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility at Wallops Island. Rocket Lab states it can support 24-hour rapid call-up capability for defense needs and urgent constellation replenishment, and is currently licensed to launch 12 missions per year. New Zealand and the U.S. are also places where engineering teams work. The other location is Canada. Rocket Lab also calls themselves an end-to-end -end space company that provides customers with streamlined access to orbit as a single mission partner, meaning that in addition to launch services, they provide space systems that are described as the building blocks for spacecraft. Think components like composite structures, reaction wheels, star trackers, radios, command and control spacecraft software, flight and ground software services, high voltage space grade batteries, and separation systems. Separation systems are actually important and underrated aspects of making access to space more economical and efficient by reducing weight and complexity. Rocket Lab does a good job of explaining them as motorized light band and canisterized spacecraft dispensers, CSD, which are used to separate spacecraft from the launch platform into orbit. The motorized light band is a ringed system with sizes from 8 inches in diameter up to 39 inches in diameter. Light bands deploy spacecraft via motors and a mechanical linkage. The CSD is a reliable and cost-effective housing for small spacecraft that protects a spacecraft during launch and deploys them in space. Fully encapsulated, the CSD minimizes damage risk and eliminates the necessity for heavy or complicated interface structures between the spacecraft and launch vehicle platform. When it comes to solar energy systems, they have cover glass interconnected cells, CICs, and panel products, each specifically designed for missions to low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, and geosynchronous orbit or interplanetary applications. If you're interested in solar energy on planet Earth, please watch the video about the long-term plans of FIRST Solar after this video. Now moving on to their spacecraft design services that center around their photon spacecraft that has configurations for low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, geosynchronous orbit, and interplanetary missions. It can also operate as the kick stage of Electron during launch, then transition into an operational spacecraft on orbit, eliminating the parasitic mass of deployed spacecraft and enabling full use of the fairing volume for payloads. Photon is designed so it can also fly on Neutron and even other third-party launchers, and as a secondary payload on rockets developed under the National Security Space Launch Program of the U.S. Space Force. According to Rocket Lab, Photon spacecraft can be used to conduct space-related scientific research, collect imagery and other remote sensing data about the Earth, carry out lunar and other deep space planetary missions, and to demonstrate new space technologies. That's why Photon has also been selected for interplanetary missions to Mars and Venus. The company's approach allows a wide range of cases to be covered from selling individual spacecraft components for use by customers in constructing their own spacecraft to complete spacecraft design, manufacture, and on-orbit operations. The intention of having end-to-end -end space system solutions is so customers can procure launch services, spacecraft, ground services, and on-orbit management from one source, significantly streamlining their path to orbit. In order to offer a broad and competitive range of space systems at scale, innovation is key, as demonstrated by the more than 200 issued U.S. patents and more than 90 issued foreign patents. The U.S. issued patents expire between 2024 and 2042. Acquisitions are also made when appropriate. 
For example, the following companies were acquired at the start of this decade. Sinclair Interplanetary in April 2020, Advanced Space Solutions Inc. in October 2021, Planetary Space Corporation in November 2021, and Sol Aero Technologies in January 2022, Sol Aero Holdings Inc. and the aerospace software firm Advanced Solutions Inc. The end-to-end space company approach, coupled with Rocket Lab's relatively early entry into the market, deliver a first-mover advantage ahead of potential new and less established newcomers to the industry, giving them a leg up in terms of opportunities to capture a higher volume and value of customer missions. Part of what lessens the complexities of constantly needing to innovate is vertical integration, enabling close control from design to manufacturing to launching operations at a more rapid pace than if outside parties needed to be involved. For instance, Rocket Lab operates their own propulsion test infrastructure. Rocket engine testing is done at a propulsion test complex near Auckland, New Zealand, where there are multiple custom-built vertical test stands for liquid propulsion, composite tank, component, and static stage fires. Similar to LC1, the benefits of operating their own private test complex helps avoid delays and schedule conflicts that are common at shared test facilities. With their broad capabilities and a record of consistent launch success, Rocket Lab is already on its way to claiming its market share. Not too surprisingly, government agencies make up part of the customer base, some of which are the U.S. Department of Defense, DOD, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, NASA, and the National Reconnaissance Office, NRO. On the commercial side, there are domestic and international commercial spacecraft operators like Black Sky Holdings, Canon, Canaeus, Capella Space, Planet, OHB Group, and Synspective. Though this does seem impressive, the space economy is still young, and the potential pool of clients is limited relative to other more developed industries. Rocket Lab readily mentions they derive a substantial amount of revenues from only a few of their customers, meaning a minor reduction in customers, especially government ones can have a substantial impact on future revenues and contracted backlog. As the industry matures, this lack of customer quantity and revenue diversity could become less of an issue for Rocket Lab and its peers. In order to manage their supply chain, Rocket Lab states they use third-party enterprise resource planning systems and tools that are largely supported by an in-house team of enterprise information systems personnel. They go on to explain multiple sources are used when possible but in some cases they purchase various inputs and services from a single source. In those situations, the risk of relying on one supplier is addressed by increased buffer stock, particularly on long lead items. Other considerations come from competition presented by other space companies, namely companies providing dedicated and rideshare launch vehicles to deliver payloads to generic and custom planes, torque inclinations, and altitude trajectories, such as Northrop Grumman, SpaceX, United Launch Alliance, a joint venture between Lockheed Martin Corporation and the Boeing Company, Firefly, ABL, and established Russian, Indian, Chinese, European, and Japanese launch providers. Then competition from companies in the spacecraft segment include Airbus, Lockheed Boeing, General Atomics, General Dynamics, Maxar Technology, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon Technologies, Thales Alenia Space, Astro Digital, Tyvac, and York Space Systems. This also extends to companies providing spacecraft components in the commercial market such as Ball Aerospace, Raytheon, Collins Aerospace, Bradford Space, Honeywell Aerospace, GOM Space, Redwire, and Beyond Gravity. In light of this competition, Rocket Lab has stated they believe they can compete favorably in terms of the following competitive factors. Flight heritage and reliability, delivery schedule, ability to customize products to meet specific needs of the customer, performance and technical features, price, and customer experience. To keep developing and address competition, Rocket Lab says their growth strategy is based around increasing the number of launch services contracts and be entrusted with higher value payloads to drive an increase in their average selling price of their launch services. To this end, they outline several areas they intend to grow into, which could be indicative of the direction commercial space is heading as the 2030s near. For starters, holding an established reputation of accessing space reliably, frequently, and cost effectively will remain a priority to penetrate the available market for on-orbit constellation management and ultimately address the space applications market, representing the largest addressable market in the space economy. Then launch service verticals are to be expanded, meaning additions such as hypersonic accelerator suborbital test electron, HASTE for short. On top of that, there's the aforementioned neutron launch vehicle that has the potential to increase the addressable launch market due to the additional lift capacity enabling higher revenue per launch. 
Improvements to existing measures are also mentioned, namely manufacturing scaling and cost reduction strategies in the production of spacecraft components and subsystems to increase market share in the area of large constellation design. On a related topic, they intend to broaden their portfolio of strategic components for spacecraft by commercializing solutions developed for their launch vehicles and family of photon spacecraft. Essentially, they plan to offer components like avionics, subsystems, radios, and batteries that were originally designed for their own craft. Then something unique to Rocket Lab and their peers in the industry is their relationship with governments and the regulations they must comply with in order to operate. After all, space technology is highly transferable to military technology, and that naturally leads to issues of national security. Regulations generally concern the areas of export and import control, economic sanctions, trade embargo laws, and restrictions. As one would expect, these can vary depending on where a company does business. In Rocket Lab's case, they are mainly subject to the regulations of the U.S. Department of Transportation, Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, the New Zealand Space Agency, and other government agencies in the United States, Canada, and New Zealand. For example, LC-1 was made possible largely due to a bilateral treaty between the United States and New Zealand that enables Rocket Lab to use U.S. launch and spacecraft technology for launches at LC-1 that otherwise would not be permitted for launches from foreign soil. The company has mentioned this treaty provides a competitive advantage over other companies, launching rockets from outside the U.S. that do not have the benefit of such a treaty. Operating their own private launch complex also affords them the benefit of complete control over launch schedule and availability due to the absence of needing to obtain required regulatory clearances for launches, as well as not having to compete with other launch providers at a shared site. Though pay close attention because they only operate their own private launch complex. That does not mean they own the land, which is actually leased. The current term of the lease expires on November 30th, 2024, with Rocket Lab having the right to renew it for four more terms of three years each. In other words, it is possible to continue using the launch complex through at least 2036. Half a world away is Rocket Lab's LC-2, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport within the NASA Wallops Flight Facility in Wallops Island, Virginia, which we also mentioned earlier. At this location, Rocket Lab has access to a dedicated launch pad for Electron and operates an integration and control facility within the Wallops Research Park. This facility is dedicated to secure vehicle and payload processing facilities. The facility can process several Electron launch vehicles and customer spacecraft concurrently, which the company says enables rapid and responsive launch opportunities and parallel launch campaigns. The use of LC-2 is regulated by an agreement providing the rights to access the facilities, launch property, and services at this launch complex until expiry on September 28, 2028. Then if you recall, LC-2 is licensed to support 12 missions per year, likely due in part to Rocket Lab having a Category 1 certification under the NASA Launch Service Program. Category 1 is the lowest ranking, while Category 3 is the highest ranking in the program. This doesn't necessarily point to anything inferior about Rocket Lab's operations at the facility, more so that it's a newcomer to the facility with the potential to achieve higher categories. License categories are obtained based on factors like experience, demonstrated reliability, and NASA audits. With a good track record at that facility, it is possible Rocket Lab or other newcomers could reach category two or three. Due to the types of customers we discussed earlier, Rocket Lab's business development team is based primarily in the United States and focuses on government customers. They state, given the well-defined and consolidated nature of our customer base, we are able to adequately address our market with a lean and focused team. A large portion of those team members are said to have previously worked for government agencies and large institutional space and technology companies. Allowing them to use their in-depth knowledge and understanding of the industry and draw on a vast network of contacts to support business development. This underscores the close ties and personal connections involved in the space economy. In addition to conferences, industry events, and direct outreach where connections can be made to drive sales leads with relatively low cost. Another commonality Rocket Lab shares with its peers is outer space itself that presents unique environmental risks such as coronal mass ejections, solar flares, and other extreme space weather events, and potential collisions with space debris or other spacecraft. Then to a topic of a unique risk for Rocket Lab involving Peter Beck, the founder of the company. It has been stated he is a crucial source of most ideas and a key driver of executing them. If he were to leave Rocket Lab for any reason, it would undoubtedly have a profound impact on the company. Well, that does it mission accomplished. 
You now have a better idea of what Rocket Lab is and the broader space economy. Please follow us Sencor and stay tuned for coverage of more businesses.